something for everybody. There's some history, there's some math, um, there's some recent research results, and then there's some applications in the end. Um, so I hope that some everybody gets a little bit of something out of here. Um, great. So I want to start with uh, history. Um, it, AI is in the news so much these days. I had somebody tell me recently, oh, did you know that machine learning started in 2013? And I was like, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> it's actually really old. Um, and machine translation is, is really, really old. So any task in artificial intelligence that starts with a machine, that's one of the older tasks in artificial intelligence. So this is a, um, the, the first research in machine translation happened in the late 40s. Um, it was one of the first things that people tried to use the digital computers that were um, developed for World War II for. Um, people thought, oh, cryptography, decrypting a cipher is the same thing as decrypting Russian, uh, so let's just try the same techniques and see if we can build an MT system. So this is a video that came out in 1955, I think, and uh, about the Georgetown experiment where the pioneering work was done. They hadn't reckoned with ambiguity when they set out to use computers to translate languages. A $500,000 supercalculator, the most versatile electronic brain known, translates Russian into English. Instead of mathematical wizardry, a sentence in Russian is to be... One of the first non-numerical applications of computers, it was hyped as the solution to the Cold War obsession of keeping tabs on what the Russians were doing. Claims were made that the computer would replace most human translators. At present, of course, you're just in the experimental stage. When you go in for full-scale production, what would the capacity be? We should be able to do about whether modern commercial computer and about one to two million words an hour. And this would be quite an adequate space to cope with the whole output of the Soviet Union in just a few hours computer time a week. When do you hope to be able to achieve this speed? If our experiments go well, then perhaps within uh, five years or so. And finally, Mr. McDaniel, does this mean the end of human translation? So yes, for uh, translators of scientific and technical material, but as regards poetry and novels, no, I don't think we'll ever replace the translators of that type of material. But despite okay. the hype, it ran. So if you didn't hear that, he, he basically said, you know, in three to five years' time, we won't need human translators anymore. And this was in 1955. Um, so there was a lot of work left to be done. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, the first uh, conference on machine translation was in 1952. Um, there was a, a Yehoshua Bar Hillel, who was a, who was a linguist and a mathematician. He was assigned by the United States government to kind of round up what was going on with machine translation research in the early 50s, and he organized the first conference. And Bar Hillel was skeptical that uh, there would ever be a machine translation system that would, um, that, that the translation problem would be solved um, in a complete way. And so in the very first paper that was ever published about machine translation, um, which was published in, ahead of this conference in 1951, he argued that for most settings, you would need something like a, a mixed MT, is what he called it, where you would have uh, a human somehow in the loop, and you would have like the human bringing in common sense reasoning and world knowledge, and then you'd have a machine translation system that would be you know generating suggestions that maybe the human could use to do their job. And that was his original conception of like the most practical use of machine translation. And uh, so people started doing this in the mid 50s. And what's the most shocking thing is that in 2019, this is still what people do. So this is like kind of a translation environment that translators use, and uh, there's been all this kind of hype about neural MT. And so now what people do is they get some MT output maybe in the right-hand side of the translation environment where they work, and then they uh, sort of put that where they're working, and then they start sort of fixing errors and correcting things. Um, and this is called post-editing. People have been doing this for 50, 60 years. For the most part, people don't really like using it um, because as a, as a workflow, it kind of violates most, you know, if you take like a HCI class in undergrad or an early master's degree, this violates like most basic HCI principles. So it, like there's no sort of back off if there's an error. There's no dialogue to sort of help resolve uncertainty. It's just machine output and then you try to correct it. And uh, so people like, this is basically how it's used today. And in, in localization, people equate post-editing and machine translation, and they, they really are not the same thing. 
One is a workflow and a way of interacting with the machine translation system. The other is a technology. Okay, so the first time that uh, in the um, historical record you can find somebody talking about post-editing was uh, this guy, uh, Robert Baer, who was a physics professor at Brown University. Um, and he was tasked in the mid-60s with trying to translate um, uh, Soviet uh, nuclear science, like uh, physics journals. And uh, he used the Georgetown system, uh, he got the output of the MT system, and then he tried to correct it. And he said that he, uh, this gave him a quote, slave's eye view of what it was like to work with a machine. Um, and he said, you know, the results were most unhappy. I spent most of my time editing, and I took longer than if I had just started from scratch. And this, for the most part, was most people's experience working with machine translation, really up until sort of NeuralMT was productized in 2016. But it's still kind of the case today. Even NeuralMT systems, they make very odd mistakes. Um, and so translators have to be very careful when they work with them. And so you're kind of getting to this point where there have been 70 years of research, and it's, it's now, it's just sort of going into localization. People are dipping their toes in. But it's going in in this way that we've known for you know, 60, 70 years, people don't like using. So um, in the late 60s, this is uh, Martin Kay. He's a, he's a pioneering computational linguist. He's actually at Stanford now. He's, in a, he's still in the faculty. He's in his mid-80s now. Um, but in the late 60s, when he was at the RAND Corporation, he was the first to propose this sort of real idea of interactive MT which is that you have an MT system and, and you slowly but surely pick at pieces of what the translator is doing and trying to automate them with a the machine. Um, and he, you know, he wrote a very famous position paper in 1980 um, where he showed kind of a conception of what it would look like. So here's somebody translating from French and it, you know, it's sort of giving them suggestions. This was long before there were CAT tools or you know, any of the software that people use um, uh, today. But it, it, it incorporates some of the very same ideas. Um, but Martin Kay was a machine translation researcher, and so at, at his heart, what he was trying to think about is like, how do you bring this machine into a human translator workflow? Um, so the problem that we're after with interactive MT is that um, if you're using, if you know, everybody uses Google Translate now in a consumer setting, um, you can translate a web page, you can use it on a mobile app. Um, I used it, I was in Germany last week, I used it in the grocery store, you know, you can hold it up and like figure out what, what things say, and that's terrific and the price is right, it's super fast. Um, when you're in a business setting, uh, you usually have some sort of quality standard. And it's not the case that a machine learning system can give you a certificate of correctness when it makes a prediction. So um, in correctness in a business setting, usually you have these sort of extra ling linguistic factors that matter. If you're doing software localization, you have like a string length, you have a certain budget of characters to fit a string on a button. Um, if you have like marketing guidelines, you have brand voice. If you have lexical resources where you have to translate a product name the same way over and over again, the system has to somehow know that this is the way that this particular term has to be translated all the time. These are the problems that come up in localization, right? So you've got to have today, you've got to have a human somehow in the loop. And the crux of the problem is how to make that human intervention efficient. And this is a really exciting research area that people have been working on, like I said, since the late, late 60s. And the whole problem is optimizing this human plus machine loop. All right, does that make sense? And we, we see increasingly these human machine systems all the time. Um, but what's cool is that this kind of this idea started in machine translation a long time ago, decades ago. Um, and so this was the first, uh, this is sort of what Kay conceptualized. Um, and this was like an old rule-based machine translation system from the early 70s. So he had this idea that you would take source text, you would like do some kind of linguistic analysis, so you'd get some parses, you would have somebody who was an expert on the source side who would tell you what the right syntac syntactic analysis of the source is, then you'd have a transfer mechanism that would transfer it to the target using rules, and then you would have a generation mechanism that would generate a bunch of translations. And then you'd have somebody on the target side who would be verifying fluency. So they would be looking at what the machine generated and picking out which one was actually fluent. So that's what these two like sort of 1950s looking guys are doing in this workflow. Um, and people built systems like this in the 70s and 80s. They didn't work terribly well, but people tried. And it was really in the late 90s when statistical MT um, was uh, 
people were starting to build these statistical machine learning systems, that this idea was revisited and a system was actually built. And that system was this one. It was called uh, TransType. And it was uh, developed in Canada. It was funded mostly by the Canadian government in the late 90s and early 2000s. Some of the TransType people are still floating around in the localization community. Like if you go to a conference, you might meet Elliot Maklovich. He's like a translator. Some of you might have met him. He um, was one of the people on TransType. George Foster, who floats around a little bit, you might see him sometime. He was also one of the um, uh, principal investigators on this. And uh, so now you have a system where you have a source text on the left hand side, somebody's translating to French, and you now have a drop down box. So there's a machine translation system that's sort of generating suggestions while the translator is working. Um, and this system uh, didn't, like conceptually, it was interesting, but it turned out still not to work. In the, in the main experiment, this was like eight years or something of research. And in the, in the, in the final experiment where they tried it, it turned out that users ended up just trans typing over 70% of the text. So they basically just weren't using the machine suggestions at all. Um, and so this was, an, this was an early machine translation system. This was actually even before phrase-based, statistical phrase-based machine translation. This was a word-to-word -word statistical system. So the MT system just was not very strong and wasn't very good. Okay, so um, when I started working on um, uh, machine translation, I started working on MT in 2008, and I got interested in interactive MT around 2010, 2011, and started building systems. Um, and this was the first one that we built, um, my co-founder and I. Uh, he was at Google at the time, I was at Stanford, and we started working together. And this was the first thing that we built. So it was really, really naive. It just showed a source sentence, and it showed in the text area, this was actually Google Translate output. Because um, we wanted to see, like the whole history of Interactive MT was just kind of a disaster that people didn't like using MT, the MT wasn't good enough, and we wanted to see if in 2012 the MT was like actually good enough. And so we, we just took Google Translate output and we asked people to fix it and we compared it to an empty text area. And what we found, interestingly enough, was that people were not only faster uh, when they post-edited, but they were also more accurate, which was an unexpected result. Somebody had had this result actually in 2009, but this was the first time it was shown in, with professional translators. Um, and the reason for that is that there's a significant priming effect when humans work with translation. So think about like the whole reason that um, uh, there's autocomplete, like when you do an Amazon search or when you do a Google search, is because it was discovered that people are people are uh, precision oriented. Our brains are precision oriented; they're not recall oriented. So if I'm thinking of a query, I might have some sort of fuzzy idea of what that query is, and I start typing, and the system will give me a more, much more specific suggestion, and I can recognize that that's right faster than I can type it myself, and that gives the system a better query, so it can give me a better result. It's the same idea here. If the MT input is good enough, it can actually result in better translation. And we actually, there's a, there's a quote in this paper, we asked the translators what they thought of the suggestions, and they said it was way better, one of them said it was so much better than Google Translate. Um, and it was Google Translate output. And so that kind of shows the, the lingering bias that people have against machine translation. When you don't tell them what it is, they actually find that it's useful. So in uh, 2013, we built, a, built another system. Now we got interested in implementing predictive typing for the first time. So this is again translating from French to English. And uh, now this system would actually do predictive typing. So as you start typing words and phrases, it would, it would change its output um, based on what you would type so far. And so you can see what the user has typed. That's kind of a hint for what the rest of the translation is. So this is actually better from a human machine dialogue perspective. I criticized post-editing earlier in this talk by saying like there's no sort of dialogue to resolve amb ambiguity. Here there's actually a dialogue between the, the user and the machine. The user is saying, you know, this is part of the translation, I want this, I want that. And the machine can use that to resolve ambiguity. The system still didn't learn, so all it could do was sort of respond to user input. It didn't actually learn from what anybody did. Um, and we found that when we use this, this was the first time we had uh, we could build a system that again the translation quality the final translation quality was higher than post editing. 
So by sort of forcing the user to engage in a dialogue with the machine, you again got another increase in translation quality. So we started off with scratch translation versus post editing, and then we added interactive MT on top, and we were the first to show that actually you can now build an interactive MT system where, um, where people can produce higher quality translation than if they were just working alone in isolation. Okay, so in, uh, in 2015, we, uh, we started a company, and we you know, basically just kept building new versions of the same system that we've been building for six or seven years. Um, and we started adding stuff from localization. So uh, when we first built the system, we thought that translation memory was like the dumbest idea ever. So we just didn't even put it into the system. It seemed like, why would you, why would you want that? Um, but it turns out it's like kind of useful, you know. Uh, <laughs> so so we built that and we put it in there, um, and then we got interested in terminology. So we um, you can do interesting things with an MT system um, because an MT system is just like a huge translate. It's basically trained on a huge translation memory, right? It's trained on all this parallel text, and that parallel text has lots and lots of sentences, like a big concordance, and so you can start to use the MT system to do interesting things with terminology. And then, uh, yeah, so that's the terminology part. And then we started to fiddle with the uh, fiddle with the workflow itself. So, you know, we sort of redesigned it again, where now you can get next word alternatives, whereas before we had gotten rid of them. We found that the drop-down box is actually the wrong interaction for translation. Drop-down boxes work really well for something like autocomplete, uh, like email, when you're using Gmail, when there's a very limited vocabulary. But when there's a, like just an open domain natural language vocabulary, people read all the suggestions you give them, and if they're bad, they spend more time reading than they actually do translating. So we got rid of the drop-down box, but then we decided, oh, maybe we can just put in some little alternatives there, and people like that. And now here's where we are today. Um, so the interface is much more stripped down than it, it ever has been before. And the main change is the suggestions which now we use neural MT, and MT really works well. Like, uh, this, this screenshot was back in um, 2016 when we hadn't launched our neural MT system, and the, the changes with neural MT have been really profound, not only in terms of translation quality, but um, the, the, things, the, the ways in which we can use them for interactive MT are really, really exciting relative to what we had to do with the phrase-based system. So the old phrase-based system, to make it do predictive typing and adaptation and all the things that I'm going to talk about in this talk, we had to do all these unnatural and ugly things with the system to make it work that way. Um, but with the neural MT systems, and I'll talk about this a little bit, um, they're much more amenable to doing translation in this type of setting. And that's what sort of the rest of the talk is about. Um, but I thought maybe I'd show it to you first. Um, so why don't I open it up, and I actually have here, um, so I have the Wikipedia page about the Georgetown experiment. And if we go up to the top, I was fiddling with it a bit earlier, let me delete all of this. Okay, so let me zoom in a little bit, and I'll show you how this works. So. This is, this is the Wikipedia page for uh, machine translation. I've loaded it into the system. You see the Arabic there on top. Um, and then there's a cursor here where I'm going to type. And the output of the MT system is here. So um, it's showing me its current suggestion uh, for what it thinks this sentence is. And this is actually completely correct. So I could just start auto-completing the translation instead of um, uh, typing it myself. Maybe I want, you know, instead of 17th, maybe I want that. Um, and then I'm done. So then I come down to the second segment. Um, and now this, this translation is pretty good, but it's a little bit wonky. Um, so the is right, but there's a word here that's missing, which is tari, which means history. If I type the history of, now this is looking pretty good, automatic. Translation started in the 1950s after World War II. And now, here's an interesting one. So it says the Georgetown experience. The word for experience and experiment, they're the same word in Arabic. So here it just, it's like a word sense problem. It doesn't know what the right word sense is, so I'll go with that. 
That's correct. In 1954, included a sentence that was automatically translated from Russian to English. So that's pretty good. Um, and so you can sort of see how the translator will start to get these suggestions, and it's more of a dialogue than just uh, than uh, you know sort of typing a translation from scratch. And the system is also adaptive. So this is another sort of big innovation in the last couple of years with MT systems is that you can make systems that actually learn as they're used. And it's easier to see in kind of a screen capture. So this is me, again, translating from Arabic to English. And uh, the same interface we just saw, I'll let the, inter the uh, um, animation recycle. But when we go back to the top, you'll see that it doesn't know the capital of the United Arab Emirates. It gives this weird translation that doesn't make any sense. And so I'll autocomplete, and I'll type Abu Dhabi. The rest of the translation is pretty good. So I'll start autocompleting again. Now there's a word choice here. Imara in Arabic does mean principality, but in this particular sense, I want more of a transliteration, so I'll choose Emirate. And then I finish. And we go down to the second segment, and you can see there's another weird translation of Abu Dhabi, but now I just learned it from the first segment, so I can autocomplete again. And so the system uh, learns in real time as it's used. And this is one of the main complaints of, of people who use machine translation is that it makes the same mistakes over and over again, and the system never learns anything. You can see this if you use Google Translate. You can put the same string into it over and over again, you'll get the same response. In an enterprise setting, people are you know, basically just making training data. That's what translators do, and you should be able to learn from that. And so we can build systems now that actually do that. And that makes the whole workflow that much faster. So this, if, if any of you, has anybody worked with like custom machine translation, you've trained systems yourself? Anybody? Probably a couple people, yeah. So you know, you have some cadence where you retrain these systems like once a quarter or once a year. Like you don't have to do that anymore. You don't need a person on staff who like knows how to train systems and all that kind of stuff. You just hook this up and it learns all the time. Um, and so we have customers in their workflows that they've had systems that have been learning for like two years at this point and they've never been uh, retrained. They just learn all the time. Okay, so that's a little bit about where Interactive MT comes from. Interactive MT is a subdomain of machine translation research, which is a subdomain of natural language processing, which is a subdomain of artificial intelligence, which is a subdomain of computer science. So that's where we kind of fit. We're in this sort of niche area of, of machine translation research. Um, so now we'll go into some more research results. But I'll stop there if anybody has any questions. Yeah? So uh, how do you do the train without training, retraining it? How do you improve the algorithm? I'll talk about that in a minute. So the question was, how do you do the retraining? And I'll talk about um, how we do that in the uh, second part of this talk. OK, so I'm going to talk first about going from statistical machine translation to neural machine translation. Um, this was joint work with some of my colleagues um, that we published in 2016. And I mentioned that um, with the statistical machine translation system, so like MOSIS, if anybody's familiar with that, which is one of the, you know, sort of the standard statistical MT system that people use, you had to do these really unnatural things to make it do um, predictive typing, which is we call this prefix decoding. So you give it a prefix, and it gives you a complete translation. Um, so here, you know, you give it uh, a prefix, Yemeni media, whatever, and underline. Um, the user has typed part of the German, and then the system's supposed to complete the sentence by suggesting in der Hauptstadt, which is in the capital. So the suggestion is useful when the translator sort of accepts the rest of it. Um, and it's most useful when the very next word is acceptable, because then the translator can just sort of autocomplete. So that's what we want to do. We want to sort of bias the system towards doing very good sentence completion and getting the next word right. Um, and the way that you used to do um, search, so search in a machine translation system, this is when the system is in the mode of generating translations. So it takes the sentence, it takes its trained model, it starts generating suggestions, and then it scores them with that model. And it returns results in the order in which they're scored. It's just this big ranking system, is basically the way that they work. And the way that you would do that 
is you would start translating bits and pieces of the source. You would then see if they matched what the user gave you. If they didn't match it, you would just throw it away. And you would keep searching until you found something that matched what the user gave you. And what this did was result in a lot of useless work, because you generate a bunch of translations that don't match what the user did, and you have, you know, so you do all this extra work, and you only end up with a couple translations that actually match the prefix that you got from the user. So what we started working on was instead starting to run search on what the user gave you. So you do search against the prefix, which is a little bit weird. Instead of like translating the source, you're translating the target only backwards was the way that we implemented it. And so that's why I'm saying it's this sort of unnatural thing that you did in machine translation systems. Um, and so what we would do is we'd take the target and we'd run search on the target, translating it back into the source. When we get to the end of the target, which was what the user gave us, then we would start running normal machine translation search, translating what was left of the source, right? So we, we translate the target into the source. When we get to the end of the target that the user gave us, we start translating the source into the target. It's kind of like backwards. But that's what you had to do in these old systems. And uh, you could also do, while you were doing this, you could also start to adapt the model weights. So you could take the model and you could make it um, per start to prefer the targets that were given by the user. And this worked great. You could add little features to make it start to prefer what the user did instead of um, uh, and, and sort of match what the user did more closely. And this was a lot of work. So this was like sort of, I don't know, nine months of research to make this work. And right when we had our results, we had it all done, this was right in sort of early, late 2015-ish, something like that. And so the first sort of neural MT systems were starting to come out. And um, one of my colleagues, Tom Luong, had a system at Stanford and um, so we thought, well, let's, let's try a neural MT system on this, uh, on this problem, which is taking a, taking a user prefix and uh, generating a completion. And the neural MT systems have a much simpler search procedure. The way that they generate translation is very, very simple. They just translate word for word. So they just predict a word, score it, predict a word, score it, predict a word, score it, predict a word, score it. And it's very, very easy to move to this prefix constrained decoding um, scenario because you just have, you already know what the system should predict because you're given that by the user. So you just run exactly the same procedure, only you just score what the user gave you. It's very simple. The system requires absolutely no modification whatsoever um, to do this prefix constraint decoding task. Whereas we had spent six months sort of modifying and adapting this phrase based system to do this task. And so this was like hugely embarrassing. So we have this great result. Uh, this is a blue score on the left-hand side, so a blue is a, the standard measure that we use in research to measure machine translation quality. Basically what it means is you have a reference from a human translator, the system generates something, and you measure the overlap between those two translations. It's very simple. You just look at words that match. That's it. There's no notion of semantics, there's no notion of syntax, there's no notion of any extra linguistic factors. It's just matching words um, from the output of a machine versus what a human did. And uh, so higher is better, 100 is perfect, zero is uh, you didn't match anything. And you know, sort of the one to 2% gain, this is like a research paper. So you know, we had gone from a baseline of 58 to 62, four blue points, hooray, we get a research paper. Uh, next word, prediction accuracy. So this is how many times does the system get the next word off the end of the prefix right? You can actually compute an accuracy there. So that's just a percentage. We get almost a 10% improvement in that. And then we just take this neural machine translation system with no modification whatsoever, and it's nearly as good in terms of blue score, and it's significantly better in terms of next word prediction accuracy. So this was like a two-day experiment that was better than six months of research. So this was like really, really exciting. The only problem was that uh, it took 10 seconds to translate a single sentence. So these early neural machine translation systems were extremely slow, which is why you couldn't really use them in a production setting. So whereas it took one, less than one-tenth of a second with our phrase-based system to get the best performance with neural MT, we need 10 seconds. And we're trying to generate translations while, while like a user is typing. 
So we didn't have 10 seconds to wait for the system to generate translations, right? So that, so we couldn't, we couldn't, we were like, wow, this is definitely the direction we need to go, but we've got to solve this problem with uh, uh, translation being so slow. Okay, so that was uh, 2016. Um, for the past about year and a half or so, we've had a neural MT system in production and we've been focused on the domain adaptation part. So I showed you that example where the system learned the phrase Abu Dhabi. And in the first segment, I typed Abu Dhabi, and in the second segment, it had learned Abu Dhabi, and now was, it was part of its suggestion. So that is what we've been really focused on, is how can we make that learning procedure happen as quickly as we can? How can the system adapt to what's happening while a user is working, um, in as few uh, 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 cycles with the human user as we can. Does that make sense? Does anybody have questions about the previous part? Now we'll go into the learning part that, uh, that was asked about. Okay, so I've mentioned the interactive MT system can adapt in two ways. One is during inference, which is another word for search. So I, the human user gives the, tr gives the system part of a translation, and the system can adapt to that by changing its suggestions based on what the user did. And then during training, it can also take the full translation from the user and update its full model so that it can generate better suggestions in the future. So there are sort of two levers that we can press to make the system better as it's being used. And you can sort of see this here. <coughs> so when the translation is changing here while the user is typing, that's during search. The system is just updating its suggestions while the user types, and it's really important that that's fast. So we obviously don't have a budget of 10 seconds to wait every time the user types another word. We've got to get it back really, really quickly, because we have to account for time over the network as well. So it's not just translation generation time. It's time to send the request to the translation system over the network and get the response back from the network. So the right speed is really important. Okay, so when we're doing personalized interactive MT, this is personalizing a system to a particular user or to a particular enterprise workflow uh, that the system is being used on. There are two ways that we can do that. We can do it in batch. And this means that we take a huge batch of data um, up front Usually this is like, if you're in localization, you have like a TMX file, right? You have a big translation memory. You can just train on that TMX file all at once. And that's one way you can have the model adapt. The other way you can have it adapt is online. So you just get one sentence in at a time as it's being used in the workflow. And we do both in our system. So you can give it a big block of existing data and it will train on it. But you can also just stream data into it online by giving it one sentence at a time. And that's how like a human user uses the system. Um, the thing, the trick of it is, is that you've got to do it really, really quickly um, because the human is typing. And if it's not turned around in less than, say, a third of a second, then the system starts to feel sluggish. Most people that work in translation are touch typists. And if it's really, really slow, then, then it's not useful to the user at all. So it has to be very, very fast. Um, and if you're going to do this personalized MT, you're going to end up with a huge number of models. Um, some people prefer to have like one model per translator. Some people, uh, usually in the enterprise, prefer, prefer to have like one model per workflow. So they'll have like a model for English-French marketing. Or they'll have a model for English-French product documentation or English-French legal text. So they'll adapt one to each one of these particular domains. And then as content is translated in that domain, the model will specialize over time to the domain. Um, so the way that this works is that every time there's a suggestion, every time there's a, a translation that we need to generate, we have to go grab the model from somewhere. We then need to apply the model parameters, and then we need to run search. And we need to do this really, really quickly for any user that shows up. So we grab the model out of storage somewhere, we load it up in the memory, we generate the translation, we send it back, we put the model back into, we put the model back into storage. And so you gotta do all of this really, really quickly on the back end. And when you're doing the learning part, 
you've also got to pick which parameters of the model you're going to update. And the way that we do that, so this is getting a little bit into the more technical part, is we store two sets of parameters. The first set of parameters we train on general domain text. So we'll train a system on like government data, newswire data, government proceedings, and that's just general text. So you have hundreds of millions of sentences that you can get off the internet in the public domain. That'll give you initial suggestions in the translation workflow. And then you start getting data in from the user as they start working. And that's a second set of parameters that's specific to the particular user. So you have two parameter sets. One general domain set of parameters that come off of generic data. And one specific domain set of parameters that you learn from the user while they're working. Does that make sense? And that's the model that we pull out of storage, do the translation, and then we put back in storage. So now here's the kind of a, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. How long does it take to, uh, to really have a system that's going to uh, produce what we want at the end? Uh, so, is that, so the question was, how long does it take to produce a system that gives us what we want in the end? Um, that, it's a hard question. Uh, it assumes that you know what you want in the end, which uh, <laughs> uh, most people don't know what they want. Um, so what I will show you though is how quickly it does learn. You can measure that, like how quickly the system adapts over time. I've got a slide a little bit later that I'll show that. Yeah. Have you thought of doing this, and I don't know how you do it, but have you thought of doing this on the, on the browser using something like TensorFlow for JS? We have thought about that, and I think that absolutely will happen. So the question was, can you do this on the edge? Can you do it in the browser? Um, and the answer to that is yes, I think you can. Um, I think right now the, these models are so large to get the maximum performance. Um, the production models that are used, ours are actually quite small, so they're only 36 million parameters. Um, the main version of this model that people use in research is about 300 million parameters, which is a couple of gigabytes. Um, and so I think uh, it's, it's too much to transfer the whole model to the user. Could you transfer parts of the model to the user? Probably with, you could do something like that today. We don't do that, but I think that absolutely will happen. Um, I think it's just a matter of time. It's a, it's a great suggestion. Okay, so this is the kind of overwhelming slide. Um, this is what a neural MT system looks like. Um, and the, on the left hand side is what we call the encoder. And you can think of what the encoder does is it takes in a source sentence and it creates a representation of that sentence. And that sentence is numeric. So it takes every word in the sentence and it generates a list of numbers that are going to represent that sentence. And then you have something called a decoder, and the decoder takes the representation from the encoder, and it starts to generate the translation. So this architecture has different pieces of parameters, and what you can do if you're going to do fast learning, so when we adapt this to the user data that's coming in, we can start to think about adapting different subsets of the parameters. Um, adapting the full model is relatively slow, so if we pick smaller pieces of it, then we can do that much faster. And re recall that we have to do this really, really quickly because the user can't wait 10 seconds for a translation to come back. So we're always under this time pressure to be able to give um, suggestions back to the translator. So early on when we were working on this, we you know, were experimenting with adapting various pieces of the model. You can, you know, adapt these outer pieces, these inner pieces. You can adapt the representation of the words right when they come into the encoder. You can um, adapt the representation of the target text. Um, you can adapt the classifier that sits on the output that generates the actual translation. And, uh, and we experimented with all of that. So uh, this now, we're using a transformer network. So this is sort of the, there are three main architectures that people use in NeuralMT. There's the um, um, recurrent neural network called NARNN. This was the first kind of model that came out, and it was that 2015 model that I showed you earlier. There's a convolutional neural network that's most famously used by Facebook. 
um, because the person who runs Facebook research invented convolutional neural networks, so that's what they use. Um, and then there's this transformer network which came out in 2017 um, from the Google Brain team. And this is the dominant frame, the uh, architecture that people use now. So there are these kind of competitions every year in machine translation research, and the transformer network won all of them last year. Um, so what we do when we do learning, uh, we use stochastic gradient descent, which uh, if anybody you know, kind of works in machine learning, this is one of the early, you know, first few algorithms that you learn. Um, you just uh, take a gradient of the loss function, and you do updates. And um, this uh, is how you train these systems. This turns out to be, this is an online learning algorithm by default. So it maps really, really well into our interactive setting where we're processing data online. The old machine translation systems, the statistical systems, were trained using this procedure called MERP, which assumed that you had all the data ahead of time. And it was really like hard to train them when you had this stream coming in. The neural MT systems, they're already trained with SGD. So you can just adapt that right away into the interactive setting. So this is the second way that I mentioned. The first way that these neural MT systems are great for interactive MT is from search. They have this really, really simple search procedure where they just predict one word at a time. And we can give it a user prefix and very easily generate a complete translation. The other way that they're really easy to adapt to the interactive setting is that they already use online learning. Um, and so it's very, very easy to use them in this sort of stream-based setting. OK. So the first idea that we had was let's just adapt one network region at a time. And so these are, again, blue scores. The top is the baseline model. This is uh, English to German, I think. So we have 33.7. If we adapt the entire model, so we just take all the parameters and adapt them, we get to 41.7, so we get a really nice gain. And then if we just pick pieces, so the outer layer of the model, the inner layer, certain parts of the embedding, we lose something because we're not adapting the full model, we're just adapting a piece of it. But it's kind of unclear, like, which, you know, we lose three or four blue points, but it's not clear, like, there's no clear sign, like, which part of the model is most important. Um, they, they're all kind of drop the same, with the exception of the decoder embeddings, those really fall off. And this is, this is some evidence that the model has so many parameters, and it's sort of hard to know which ones are actually the important ones. Um, so it's very hard to pick which of the important parameters in the model that we really need to adapt. Um, so we spent, uh, you know, this was just like manual labor. We spent a bunch of time running lots of experiments trying to find pieces of the model. And after a couple months of work, we found a subset that worked pretty well, and we get back to 40.9. So we've now only lost one blue point, but uh, we're, you know, we have 6.9 million parameters that we're adapting. So we only have to adapt one sixth of the full model, and we can almost get back to the baseline. But that's like a lot of work to sort of figure out which is the which is the subset. Okay, so now here's the only slide with math. Um, uh, this is an old problem in machine learning, which is instead of picking which parameters to learn, you let the data tell you which parameters to learn. So you can do that using what's called a group lasso. And basically what this does is uh, you can set up the groups of parameters, and you add what's called a regularization term, which is that first equation there, um, into the loss function. And the loss function is what you're running SGD on. And what it says is uh, the last row is really all that matters. So this is vector math, um, and uh, you don't really need to know what it means. All it says is, this last uh, row, all it says is, if the model wants to set a certain set of parameters very, very close to zero, then go ahead and set that whole set of parameters to zero. And so that means if it's less than some threshold theta, then you just set the whole set of parameters to zero. And the model's going to try to push a bunch of these parameters really, really close to zero. It's not going to be able to set them exactly to zero. So you use this sort of cutoff, and you say if it's below some threshold, then you just set them to zero. And then you let the model, it's sort of picking which parameters it wants to set close to zero. You go ahead and set them to zero, and then you can just remove those parameters from the model. So you're letting the model pick which parameters it really wants to adapt. And this works like magic. So now you get basically back up to the baseline 
Um, you're still only adapting one sixth of the model, so it's really, really fast, but you don't compromise anything. This is also really great because when we did the fixed selection, we just had to pick pieces of the model based on the particular data set that the research scientist was doing experiments on. But in a production setting in the enterprise, we don't have the luxury of just sort of picking each data set and like tuning to that. We might want to adapt to marketing text and that may be very, very difficult, different than UI strings. And so we want the model to be able to pick which parameters are best for each one of these workflows. So now that's what the model does. You can put it on sort of any workflow and it'll pick the parameters that it needs to adapt to optimize performance on that workflow. Okay, and this all happens really, really quickly, as I said, which is what you want. Um, we've done some result. We've done some work even since we published this paper in 2018. So this is what's in production right now. So you have like the baseline, the full model, what we published in um, middle of last year. So go from 35.8 to 46.3. These days, with uh, some refinements that we figured out later, we're all the way up to 49.2. Um, and that we did experiments across all, all the languages that we have in production and you know we get these really significant gains across all different content types so it's typical in localization these days if you talk to like an MT vendor they'll be like oh we have a marketing engine or we have a, you know we have like a UI string engine or a news engine or whatever you don't need that anymore all you need to do is have a model that will tune itself to whatever domain it's being used on and you let the data determine which parts of the model to adapt, instead of having a human specialist sit there and try to figure out which parts of a model to select. Okay, so now to your question about how quickly the system learns. So, uh, what's your name? Pascal. Pascal, okay, thanks for this question. So, people typically ask, how quickly does the system learn? Um, this is an experiment that uh, we did over the summer. Um, actually, my colleague Brent did this, who's sitting right back there. Um, and we took, we have this really wild text. So this was like Yemeni Arabic. And it was uh, really, really colloquial. Um, and our production Arabic system is trained on modern standard Arabic. So this is like what you'll hear on Al Jazeera, which is nothing like what people actually say to each other. Um, and so I was really skeptical that this would actually work. Because um, the system, the domain was so different. Um, and so what you see here on the horizontal axis is number of sentences. So this is a human translator working through batches of sentences from 0 to 2,000. And what you see on the vertical axis is the blue difference between the baseline model and the adapted model. And so you see within even a, a, couple, of, a couple of tens of sentences you get a 20 blue point difference, which is absolutely profound. And the reason it learns so quickly on this domain is that the, we, all, we all often see uh, faster learning the further apart the two domains are. Because the system doesn't really have anything in its baseline <coughs> parameter set to translate what's coming in. So it is forced to adapt very, very quickly to this new stuff that's very, very idiosyncratic coming in. So in this case, it's getting all this Yemeni Arabic in. It doesn't have anything like that in the model. And so it's going to adapt really, really rapidly because it's forced to prefer what it's getting from the user. And so interestingly enough, like I thought the translators would hate this. Um, and it turned out that uh, it adapted so quickly that it was actually extremely useful for them. Um, and I think this was one of the most kind of speculative experiments that we have run. And so you see, like, it, it's kind of unstable because the, the data stream coming in, there'll be new stuff in it, the system will get worse. But you see it start to asymptote sort of between 20 and 30 blue point gain over the baseline after only 2,000 segments. So this was a translator working for, I think, four or five days, something like that. So you get this absolutely profound gain from just five, five days of work by a single translator. For many of you in the enterprise, like 2,000 segments you probably do in like a couple hours or something. Um, so the, the systems can learn really, really rapidly. Okay, um, right, so we can, we can use a model now that will learn, um, that'll learn from the data that's being trained on, and we can reduce the model size significantly by down to one-sixth of the original model size and get the same performance, which is really, really exciting. 
Okay, any questions about that? And now I've got one more short topic and then we're done. Questions? Everybody got all that? <laughs> the math part, you get that? Okay, all right, so um, word alignments. So this is work that we just, uh, actually we just, oh, the date's wrong. I put 2018, it's 2019. So this just went up on archive about three weeks, uh, two weeks ago maybe. Um, we've been working on word alignments. What are those? So a word alignment is when you have a source sentence and a target, and you have a system that will tell you which word translates into which other word. And so you can have these systems where you give it an English sentence and a German sentence, and it'll tell you all the word-to-word -word correspondences. And it'll do that automatically. And this is one of the sort of classic tasks in, in natural language processing, is finding word-to-word -word correspondences between two sentences. Um, and word alignments are, are super useful. This is um, something that people worked on, you know, like back in the 80s. Um, and, and then when you used to need word alignments as an input to training a phrase-based MT system. So you would train word alignments offline, and then you would use those, and those would go into the MT system. You don't need to do that anymore. Um, neural MT systems don't require word alignments, they generate them themselves. Um, and so you don't need that anymore, and people kind of quit working on word alignments uh, for the last couple of years. But they're really useful for enterprise localization because you can do two things with them. The first is tags. So tags are like the main difference between research and practice. In research, we just throw all the tags out because who cares about that? In localization, we really care about the tags. Um, and MT systems hate tags because they don't, they don't have any linguistic content. Usually, they're just these extra <coughs> markers. And so you have to pull them out before you put them into an MT system. And then the question is, once you generate a translation, where do you put the tags? So typically a translator will go in, and this is what they really hate doing, more than doing post-editing. It's like going in and like moving tags around and stuff. And some of you have good localization practices where you know you don't put source code in the text, and some of you have terrible localization practices where you have like JavaScript in the text, and the translators are there like moving JavaScript around and stuff. This happens all the time. And so we built into the system a tag placement uh, process where it will try to put the tags into the target for the translator. It, thinks, it puts them where it thinks they should go, and then the translator can just manipulate them. So this is another assistive system. The other thing we can use word alignments for is for um, uh, incorporating terminology into search. So um, how many people use term bases or glossaries? Most people do, right? Um, so uh, you want, ideally, the MT system to be respecting your term base. And so when it's generating output, you want it to, if there's an entry in the term base, you want that to show up in your translation output. And you use word alignments to, to make that possible, because you've got to figure out where in the source the term base entry is and where it should go in the target. So if the word alignments are good, then you can do both of these, uh, both of these things really well. It turns out that the transformer architecture, which I just told you was so great for adaptation, is absolutely horrible for word alignment. So um, this is what's called an alignment grid. On the left-hand side, you have English. On the top, you have German. And what you want to see is a shaded area where there's a correspondence between words. So like you would want to see uh, a correspondence between Franz and Frankreich. But you don't. Uh, you see it shaded down at the period. So it turns out that the transformer, just by default, it tends to align everything to punctuation. So you get these alignment grids that make no sense at all and then you can't do tag placement, and you can't uh, do uh, terminology constrained inference terribly well. And we didn't realize this. Um, what happened uh, to us was uh, we were like, oh great, translation quality is so much better. Let's put this neural MT system into production. We'll just use word alignments like we did before. And like all of our tags and terminology and just everything broke at the beginning of the summer. And so before people were complaining like, oh, translation quality should be better. Now they're like, that's fine. Now all this other stuff is broken. And so we spent like six months figuring out how to fix this. And uh, we did it. Uh, actually, I'll skip this uh, in the interest of time. Um, so what you do basically is you add a separate component of a model that you're just going to use for alignment. So on the left-hand side, we have our old alignment grid. Um, which aligns everything to the period, 
On the right-hand side, we've got the new system, which has a separate word alignment component, and you see this kind of diagonal structure, which for most languages, that's what you want to see. The, most languages have sort of local reordering, like you know, in English, the adjective comes before the noun. In other languages, the adjective will come after the noun, and so you have to flop these things back and forth. For some languages, like Japanese, which is verb final, you have these very large reorderings where you have to move the verb to the end. But for a lot of languages, you'll see this kind of diagonal pattern. And uh, this new system does exactly that. Um, in fact, it does it so well, and this is what's so exciting, is that this new model, so this is error rate. This is very easy to understand. You have a human just uh, identify manually what the correspondences are, and you just see if the model got them right. So it's just an, it's just an error rate. 0% error rate means it got all the correspondences right. 100% error rate means it got all of them wrong. So lower is better. Um, the, what we you know, just the transformer with no changes gets over half of the alignments wrong um, when it's trying to align German and English. Um, in this work, we get that down to about 21%, and that's actually better than the two classic methods for doing word alignment, which, um, you know, if anybody's ever sort of used alignments for any reason, you use one of two algorithms. One is Giza++, and the other is fast align. And Giza++ is the, you know, sort of the, the standard uh, that everybody uses, and we've you know recently achieved a new state of the art with word alignment. We've got it now down below um, the best historical algorithm for doing word alignment, um, and that means that now tags work and um, terminology works again really really well. And you of course need both of those for doing enterprise localization. Okay, so let me conclude with one slide about going from research to practice. Um, Everything that I presented today is not my own work. I, uh, for the most part, I spend time working with customers these days. I don't get to run experiments or build systems or do any of the stuff that I used to do. Um, so I have a lot of conversations with people. And here are some of the, actually, let me just go to this. Here are some of the, uh, here are some of the questions that people ask me and what I think they should be thinking about in 2019. So uh, here's a common thing people say. They'll say, we're evaluating the best engine for content type X. And as I've shown, we have systems now that will adapt to whatever they're used on. I've also mentioned that everybody uses the same algorithms. So if you use Google Translate, or Amazon Translate, or Microsoft Translator Hub, or any other system, you can just ask them, like you can just read what paper they wrote. Everybody's using the same algorithm or some variant of the same algorithm. What really matters is what you do with the data. So in 2019, people should be really thinking about data segmentation. What do you do with your data to divide it up into different domains so that you can apply these adaptive systems to them? The worst thing is to just have this huge translation memory with all your data glommed together, um, and then you have no way of letting the system adapt to the different domains. So there's no point in going around doing engine evaluations. That's old stuff. You don't have to do that anymore. The systems can learn uh, on the domain that they're used on. The second thing I hear people say is, we're evaluating MT on, you know, why low value workflow, where this is usually something like customer support chat or, you know, like message boards or something that nobody cares about. Um, it just absolutely is the case that MT is going to be like the core tool that you use to do localization. Like it will replace translation memory because basically an MT system is just a generalized translation memory. Does anybody know where translation memory came from? It was actually proposed by a frustrated translator in 1978 called Peter Ahern, who was European. He had been using these MT systems in the 70s. He said, these are terrible. Why can't you just show me what I did before and implement a database? So this is a paper published in 1979. Um, and, uh, and so instead of using this MT system, let's just have a database that I can look up things in. And that became like the industry standard. Um, but an MT system, and translation memory can only give you an output for something that's similar to something that's in its database. An MT system can give you an output for anything. So an MT system is just a generalized translation memory. And these MT systems are really good now, so they, they're just going to move into where they, people conceive that they originally would be, which is in the main component that you use for localization. Um, the third thing that people say is, oh, we're evaluating, we're, you know, we're using MT, and we're asking our vendor for a 20% rate discount. Uh, and I say, why are you doing that? 
um, like where does 20% come from? Where does, why not 30%, why not 90%, why not 0%? Like where does this number come from? Uh, and the answer is it's just a business negotiation. And it has no bearing on whether the system that you're giving people actually makes them faster, makes them more accurate, makes them more efficient. You actually have to measure that. If you're not measuring it, then this is just a number. And typically what happens is the translator just takes it on the chin, somewhere down in the supply chain. The vendor comes to them and says, look, we got this contract. We took a 20% rate discount. Sorry, you have to take a rate discount, you know, or you don't work with us. That's basically what's going on right now. But it's not based on any science or measurement. It's not based on anything. So really what you want to do is start to think about monetizing translation productivity. Because really, why do we build machines? We, make them, we build machines to make people more efficient. But we have to measure, like, do they actually make people more efficient or not? And if we figure out that they can, then we can come up with numbers to how to monetize translation productivity. But just, you know, coming up with a blanket number makes no sense. The final thing that people say is, oh, we're thinking about adding an engine into our TMS stack. Um, and legacy, you know, sort of traditional, uh, you know, enterprise localization stacks, they have these really thin connectors for MT. It's just like, send a segment, source segment out, get a translation back. That's it. And that's like staring at an HGTV through a straw. Like, you know, you're just like, yeah, you can't see anything. These MT systems can do this amazing stuff. They can do tag projection, they can do linguistic, you know, term, uh, terminology constrained decoding. And if you just have this very narrow connector where you're sending a sentence out and getting a sentence back, you're like not getting the full power of what these systems can do. Um, so really I think people should, now is the time to start thinking about re-architecting your localization stack around MT, which is really, it, sh it should be and it will touch every single uh, word that goes through a stack in the future. Right now, TM touches every single word going through a stack. In the future, with probability one, there's no doubt about it, MT is going to be touching every word in the stack. And so you really ought to start thinking about what does that look like. And that's good for the world, right? Because localization is such a noble problem. It's giving people access to information um, and giving everybody the same experience, irrespective of which language they speak. And so using technology in this way to uh, give everybody the same customer experience, giving everybody the same access to information is really a noble and de democratizing mission that we're all part of. Okay, so, you know, a couple of shameless plugs. You know, if this excites you, we're hiring. Uh, uh, we do research. We have a full research team. Um, if you're a researcher, we're especially interested in talking to you. Um, uh, all of our researchers get to push stuff into production right away, which is uh, exciting for some researchers, uh, scary for others, but if you're of that particular breed, it's a good place for you. You also get to work with uh, translators and with our uh, with enterprise customers, so we kind of work with both sets, and we have this really interesting data set that we get because we're doing online learning and production, and very few companies are doing that. Um, I think more and more will. We'll start to see these intelligent systems, whether they're self-driving cars that are learning as we drive them around, or whether there are phones adapting to what we do as we, as we walk around in the world, or these MT systems that adapt while we work. We're going to see more and more of these systems in all the various ways that we do work, um, uh, and, and even in our, in our personal lives. Um, you can find us on social media, and thank you very much. I'd love to have some questions. Sure can. So the question was, how do you work with um, languages? You know, two examples were given, like Russian and Finnish. So Finnish has, of course, really rich morphology. So you get these words that are like this long and have, you know, all these different inflections and um, declensions. Um, and that's another uh, another exciting uh, development with uh, with neural MT is that the the best systems now work at the subword level. So, so one obvious defect in the old statistical systems was that they learned parameters for each word type. So they couldn't learn, like, they would learn a different parameter for every word type in a verbal paradigm with no, no linkage between the, between the word types. 
that's obviously a bad assumption about language. Like you have a verb and you have various inflections of it. There should, the models should somehow learn those relationships. The old systems didn't learn that at all. So they were really bad at morphologically rich languages, as you suggest. The new systems um, actually work at the subword level. So they cut the words up into smaller pieces of like morphological endings. Um, and they will learn parameters over those smaller pieces and they'll learn relationships between those parameters. So that's one reason some of the biggest gains have been in um, morphologically rich languages, which the old systems were just absolutely terrible at. It's a great question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, that companies should look into or think about data um, segmentation yeah. practices. Sometimes the um, companies can't really do anything about the segmentation. For example, if the um, data is sub video subtitles, yeah. um, one sentence could be broken down into five different segments. You can't really do anything about that yeah. segmentation. Have you done any experiments or um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, uh, so, sure. Um, so the the question was, what if um, data segmentation in practice can be kind of hard? So, like, what if you have a video subtitling workflow? And I'm assuming you're thinking about something like you have like marketing videos and Hollywood videos and whatever else, and there are just lots of different domains that are going through the subtitling workflow. Um, so there's not a great way, there's some work done on um, text classification, like using text, classifier, text classifiers in conjunction with MT systems, so automatically labeling sentences, whether they're news or medical or legal or patents or whatever. Um, and none of, none of those results have been terribly convincing. So there's not like a great automatic solution for it. Um, I think one way that customers at least I see people tend to think about it as like if they have a particular style guide or you know uh, they have guidelines for a particular workflow, then they're already kind of saying like all the text going through this workflow, we want it to be sort of adhering to these parameters. And that could be like a segment of data. So something like that. But it, but it is manual and that's why I think some real thought and care, the, the, the time that's being going into evaluating different engines, that's, I'm suggesting, is not very useful time. That energy could be devoted to thinking about carefully about how to segment data um, across different workflows for then putting into a system like this. That's a much better use of time. Who's next? Oh, we have a microphone now. About uh, single words when it's not part of a sentence, for example, when uh, a word can have like different context. And, uh, would that be solved with having a key to that uh, to that word, or? About that? Are you talking about? Um, for example, there could be uh, there could be a home as a category, and there could be a home as a home button. Right. So just a, a single word. Um, uh, yeah, but just like a home button in like a software interface or something. Yeah, I, I readily concede that uh, that is not a great application for machine translation. I think that um, especially mobile app localization where you have these very, very short strings, um, you, you don't have a lot of linguistic, you, you have, you're missing two things. You're missing linguistic context in the sentence because the sentence is very short. You're also missing any sort of discourse context. You just have like random strings all over the screen and they come out in a resource file that have like nothing to do with each other. So the, the adaptation that I showed you is temporal. Um, it tries to adapt, uh, you know, there is a temporal dimension to it. So when you're working through a document and there's like somebody's name, they tend to get mentioned a bunch more times in a document. And so the system will learn that really quickly. But if you just have random strings on a mobile app interface, like it doesn't have any document level context to learn. So, so it's not a great use case. Yeah, I don't think that's a great use case. I think that's that for you know, I think uh, for the first you know for the foreseeable future, that is like a really um, a, a case that's hard to automate and make more efficient. I'm curious, what uh, deep learning framework are you using to build your models, and also? Have you used, and what are your thoughts on the Stanford uh, NLP library? Um, 
Our production, okay, so everybody heard that question. Our production systems are built on TensorFlow, and um, uh, the Stanford libraries, well, I'm a fan of them because I have a lot of code in them, uh, uh, but the old Java libraries have recently, like, that we built for a really long time, those aren't being really used anymore. And they just released a PyTorch library like three weeks ago or something like that, which is, I think, the, the sort of main linguistic pipeline that people are using in the lab now. That's where their latest course on NLP is being taught using PyTorch. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I don't think it, uh, yeah, the last few iterations of the course have been in PyTorch, of Chris's course, yeah. Yep. Hi, um, can you maybe describe a typical project life cycle? Like, you know, what you do and how much effort is, um, you know, expected from the client side, how much uh -huh. people and so on. Sure. Um, well, I'll just talk about the technical part. I won't talk about all the, you know, kind of training and all that <coughs> stuff. Just the, the technical part is really rather straightforward, which is that if, the, if there's pre-existing translation memory data, then we help um, you know, sort of collect that and segment it and create initial models. So I was mentioning the difference between like the batch and the online training. If you've already got you know, 50 million segments that you've been collecting for the last 20 years, then that's a great starting place. You train on that. Um, typically, most people haven't thought about segmenting that into different workflows. They just have it in like a big TMS or something. Um, so we do try to do a little bit of data segmentation. Um, and then depending on the rigor with which people have kept that translation memory relatively clean, like they've you know, kind of kept it up to date, and kept garbage out of it, we typically will do some filtering on the data. Because um, these neural MT systems are really sensitive to the data that they're trained on, and you can um, actually make them worse if you put uh, like sort of noisy data in them. Um, and then we just train systems. Uh, or help the customer train systems initially, which is really just uploading files to the system, um, and then off they go. So my follow-up question is, how long will that training test uh, take? And I, I wonder what the standard is, like is it per million words or, or not? Yeah, that's a good question. So you're talking about when the all the translation memory is ingested for the first time? Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, the number used to be about 10,000 segments an hour, and I don't know what the current number is. Okay, so if I were to give you a TMX with 10,000? Yeah, it's on the order of hours. Okay. Yeah. Most, I mean, the largest TMs that we have ingested are, you know, like day of training maybe, something like that. Who's next? This looks really compelling. Uh huh. Oh yeah. When can we get it? <laughs> <laughs> you can get it right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It is online. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Any other question? You need your company Lilt. What does this stand for? Lilt. Uh, well, it's a it's a um, it's a English. It's, a, it's like a lilt in your voice, you know? It's a prosodic feature, so when your voice goes like, ah, like that. It's also, a, it's also a, it's a, it's like a soft drink in Europe, in, uh, uh, in like the UK. And there's like some funny commercials about this, this soft drink. But we didn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Um, so when companies, especially the newer companies in this area, um, hear the words neural network and machine learning based translation, they just go, oh, that's so cool, we want to do that, we want to look innovative. Um, and also they think that it'll just cut down on their costs because obviously because it's done by the machine, it's going to be, it's going to cost less than the human translators, but yeah. that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. Um, so what would your approach be to those types of situations? Well, I think that's, uh, I think, I mean, the hard part, I mean, we've had to learn this the hard way, like, 
you know, the technology is all fine and great, but actually getting it into the workflow. So like I just mentioned, what's the technical part? You know, that's just training systems, that's easy. Training the translators to, to use the technology. Um, training the people, the people that we work with to, you know, start thinking about um, uh, how to curate their data and how to evaluate, find, like, the hardest thing is like you tell people machine translation and they're like, well, how good is your machine translation system? And I'm like, well, it doesn't matter because really what you're buying is final translation with the human in the loop, right? So you have to evaluate that. Um, and so there's there's a, a whole bunch of like workflow and process work that you've got to do to get this technology into an actual workflow, um, which includes the financial part of you know making the economics of it work. Um, and so that's why we've had to, um, John and I never set out to start like an MT company. We, we set out to, um, John and I met working on Google Translate and uh, you know, that's a great, you know, revolutionary, extraordinarily high impact in consumer settings. But in business, people do localization much the same way they've done it for 30 years. And we're like, why is that? That seems strange. Um, we'll just build the system and everything will be great. But actually, you know, there's an awful lot of work to do to change the way that these workflows work and all the legacy systems and the content repos and all that. Like, it's, it's a lot of work, actually. Um, so that's, that's actually the hard part, is you gotta make the commitment to transforming the workflow and then there's a lot of change management that has to be done. And I would argue that's almost the harder part. But it's it's gonna happen, everybody's gonna do it. So like it's just really a question of when are you gonna do it. Yeah. Do you take advantage of uh, written by things like uh, Bert or Elmo? Say that again, I didn't quite hear. Do you take advantage of pre-trained embeddings like BERT or Elmo? We don't. We've started looking at, um, so uh, you're mentioning two papers that are out recently. Um, we don't use pre-trained embeddings for this system. Um, we have started to look at that for, you can use these very same architectures for what's called grammatical error correction. So this is what, this is what like a reviewer does, right? So like if you have a review cycle in your enterprise workflow, you have a reviewer that comes along and makes changes to whatever the translator did. And so that's going from, if you're translating from English to German, the translator goes from English to German, and the reviewer goes from German to German prime. And that German to German prime step is like making stylistic changes and terminology changes and other sorts of stuff. And you can model that like a translation process. Um, and so we started to look at uh, look at some of that work for for grammatical error correction. Any last question? Aha. Okay. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> okay. Um, my question was just, uh, what's next? You talked, you just um, told us about the adaptive, and what is on the horizon? So my question is kind of along that line. Okay. 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 Mine was too. <laughs> okay. The vision so, for the next few yeah, years. Yeah. This this assumes that you need to have a human to um, to really tweak this system and have it learn. Yeah. But more and more, many of us still do use raw MT trained, customized, but raw. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we want to have, and I think we want to get more and more to this, I'm sorry, translators, uh, total human hands off mm -hmm. in some cases for some types of scenarios. How are we going to get there? Is that the next step? Yeah. Is yours so along that line too? <laughs> that is precisely, um, so the, precisely the question that Pascal asked, which is like how, how do we know when we've gotten there? That assumes you know where, where there is. And this gets into the question of translation quality, which actually the single most surprising thing for me coming out of the research community and into the commercial world is like nobody can agree on what translation quality is. In research we have a very, like a experimental procedure that's been known for decades and that's how we make progress. Everybody agrees on how it's evaluated, everybody agrees how the experiment should be run, and when everybody's in agreement then you can sort of make this progress. Um, even the most mature companies that uh, you know that I've encountered, they still like have kind of 
these ad hoc approaches to translation quality where they'll like show it to some, you know, a couple paragraphs to somebody and see if they think that it's good. And it's really hard to like operationalize that. So I think one thing, I've, there's one of our research scientists who's working on this right now is um, uh, providing a, a more interpretable uh, estimate or number for this graph. Like this graph is interesting because it shows the model learns over time, but it doesn't tell you like when is it good enough. You need like some kind of a number or some kind of a method to be able to say that. And so I think for us, um, tying the learning to a very definite and quantifiable quality goal and knowing when the learning procedure gets to there is something we don't quite know how to do yet, but we are working on uh, a lot. Because this is the main thing that people ask about. Precisely that, like when is, and it's a question of the business setting, like is the raw MT good enough now for, uh, I don't know, your like user forms? Like sure, why not? Like nobody cares. Is it good enough to send out in a marketing email where like if there's a typo in the subject line, your CMO goes crazy? No, it's not. But it's, like we should try to figure out when we can know in a quantifiable and objective way that it is good enough. Okay, if somebody wants to give a talk on what it, translation quality means in the <laughs> industry, as opposed to the academia, talk to me afterwards. In the meantime, thank you very much to Spence.